Hello, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you. The world has shrunk. It is interconnected. All of you represent that interconnection. Many of you are catalyzing it and accelerating it. It promises to bring extraordinary benefits, uh, but it also has challenges, and it also evokes concerns and fears. It's where entrepreneurs, like so many of you, get an idea and you build a team and you work to turn it into reality, and you launch products and companies and entire industries that transform the world. That's the power of entrepreneurship. And it's never been more important. In today's world, where our economies have undergone dramatic shifts, where businesses don't stop at borders, where technology and automation have transformed virtually every industry and changed how people organize and work, entrepreneurship remains the engine of growth, that ability to turn an idea into a reality, a new venture, a small business that creates good-paying jobs. It puts rising economies on the path to prosperity and empowers people to come together and tackle our most pressing global problems, from climate change to poverty. When people can start their own businesses, it helps individuals and families succeed. It can make whole communities more prosperous and more secure. It offers a positive path for young people seeking the chance to make something of themselves and can empower people who have previously been locked out of the existing social order, women and minorities, others who aren't part of the old boys network. Give them a chance to contribute and, and to lead. And it can create a culture where innovation and creativity are valued, where we don't just look at the way things have always been, but rather we say, how could things be? Why not? Let's make something new. The spirit speaks to something deep inside of all of us. No matter who we are, what we look like, where we come from. You
You look out across this auditorium, you're all of different backgrounds and cultures and races and religions. Some of you are from teeming cities, others are, are, are working in small rural villages. But you have that same spark, that same creative energy to come up with innovative solutions to old uh, challenges. And entrepreneurship is what gives people like you a chance to fulfill your own dreams and create something bigger than yourselves. We live in a time when more than half the world is under the age of 30. And that means we've got to make sure that all of our young people around the world have the tools they need to start new ventures and to create the jobs of the 21st century and to help lift up entire populations. And so many of you are already doing this. As I travel around the world, one of the extraordinary things that I have the opportunity to do is to meet young people in every region and to see the, the problem solving and the energy and optimism that they're bringing uh, to everything from how to generate electricity in, in environmentally sound ways in remote places that are off the, off the grid right now to you know, how do you employ uh, women in uh, remote areas uh, who all too often have been locked out of opportunity. You, you just see enormous creativity waiting to be tapped. And part of our job, part of this, this summit's job, is to make sure that we're putting more tools, more resources into the hands of these folks who are changing the world. And making sure that all of you know each other so that you can share best practices and ideas and uh, spread the word. Now, uh, I know that the daily reality is not always as romantic as all this. It turns out that starting your own business is not easy. You have to have access to capital. You have to meet the right people. You have to have mentors who can guide you as you get your idea off the ground. Uh, and that can be especially difficult for women and young people and minorities and others who haven't always had access to the same networks and opportunities. You deserve the same chance to succeed as everybody else. We've got to make sure that everybody has a fair shot to reach their potential. We can't leave more than half the team on the bench. That's why we've invested so much time and effort to make sure that America is helping to empower entrepreneurs like you. So we held our first summit back in 2010. Since then, we've brought entrepreneurs like you together in Turkey and the Emirates and Malaysia, Morocco, Kenya. And all told, we've helped more than 17,000 entrepreneurs and innovators connect with each other, access capital, find mentors, and start new ventures. 17,000. I think of uh, the Tanzanian startup that helps farmers reduce their harvest losses, or the company in Nepal that's helping to improve charity health care. There are 11 Cubans who are here today, the first Cubans to join us at one of these summits. Hola. Mucho gusto. They're ready to help create new opportunities for the Cuban people. Where are they? There they are. I want to thank uh, Antonio Gracias, uh, a leader in, in private equity and one of our presidential ambassadors for global entrepreneurship, uh, because his support was critical in bringing these young Cuban entrepreneurs here. So that's deserving of a hand. I'm also pleased to announce that we have a new group of business leaders signing on as entrepreneurship ambassadors. This is something that we started as part of the summit. Uh, and they have put their time, energy, effort, and in some cases their money uh, behind uh, entrepreneurs around the world. So are some of our new ambassadors, Sarah Blakely, CEO of Spanx, <laughs> Jane uh, Werwan, CEO of uh, Dermalogica, 
Stephen Jervidson, partner at uh, Draper Fr uh, Fisher uh, Jervidson, and Patrick Collison, uh, CEO of Stripe. Now, supporting entrepreneurs isn't just something we do around the world, it's also a key part of how we create jobs and fuel innovation here in the United States. And it's why we're working with communities to streamline the process for launching a company. Start up in a day. It's why we're expanding Innovation Core, our program to equip more scientists and engineers with entrepreneurial skills. And it's why, at this summit, dozens of top tech companies, from giants to startups, are committing to make their technology workforces look like America, including by publishing data on diversity each year and developing the tech talent of people from all backgrounds. Uh, we're very happy for the commitments that they've made, so give them a big round of applause for that. Here at this summit, we're also building on our progress with new commitments from government and business and philanthropists. So at last year's Paris Climate Talks, for example, Bill Gates and other top global investors committed to partnering with governments to invest in cutting-edge clean energy solutions. Today, we're launching an initiative to connect some of these global investors and others with clean energy entrepreneurs from developing countries. We're also announcing the Young Transatlantic Innovation Leaders Initiative, which will bring 200 of Europe's innovators to the United States each year to develop their skills. And we've got organizations like Endeavor, which supports entrepreneurs starting a $100 million fund to invest in companies across Latin America and the Middle East, in Africa and Southeast Asia. Uh, Investment firms like Capri Ventures, which will help fund international startups. So these are just a handful of the commitments, and I suspect new ventures, that are going to come out of this year's summit. So uh, all of you budding entrepreneurs, uh, don't be shy while you're here. Talk to the experts. Make your pitch. Network with potential investors. Uh, find that mentor who might help you navigate through uh, a tough patch connect with your fellow innovators, because ultimately the world needs your creativity and your energy and your vision. You are going to be what helps this process of global integration work in a way that is good for everyone and not just some. I've spoken about this before. Uh, I believe we are better off in a world in which we are trading and networking and communicating and sharing ideas. But that also means that cultures are colliding and sometimes it's disruptive and people get worried. You're the bridge, you're the glue, particularly the young people who are here, who can help lead towards a more peaceful and more prosperous future that provides opportunity for everybody. And because this is about more than just this one event, or for that matter, this one president, we're going to make sure that the United States continues to help developing the next generation of entrepreneurs. Uh, we are very proud to announce that next year's Global Entrepreneurship Summit will be hosted in India. <laughs> We've got the Indian contingent in the house. I'm, you know, I'll, I'll try to stop by if I'm invited. <laughs> but the point is, I believe in you, and America believes in you. And we believe that you have the talent and the skills and the ambition not just to pursue your dreams, but to realize them, that you can lift up not just your own families, but communities and countries and create opportunity and prosperity and hope for decades to come. That's the promise that we see in all of you. And that is the promise that we see in our outstanding panelists that you're going to hear from. Mai Medat of Egypt, who's a software engineer who started a company called Eventus, which is a one-stop online shop for people who organize events. <laughs> Jean Basco uh, Niziemana of Rwanda, who's the founder and CEO of uh, Habona Limited, a company that uses biomass and waste to develop eco-friendly fuels that uh, are used in rural Africa. Mariana Costa Checa of Peru, 
Mariana is the founder of uh, Laboratoria, which gives young women from low-income backgrounds the education and tools they need to work in the digital sector. Uh, and if that lineup's not enough, you also see it in a guy that you may have heard of uh, who uh, has done pretty well for himself, the founder and CEO of Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg. They're the real experts. Let's welcome them on stage, and we'll start having a conversation with them. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm proud of you. Thank you, man. Thank you. Thank you so much, you. Mr. President. All right. This is a good-looking group. And I could not wear a T-shirt like Mark for at least another six months, but I will take off my jacket so that I don't, don't look too formal. Soon. <laughs> soon. soon. It's going to happen soon. The, uh, so, yeah, sit down, everybody. The, uh, <laughs> relax. So uh, th these are some extraordinary uh, entrepreneurs. Some are just getting started. Some uh, seem to be moving along pretty well. Uh, and, and, but I thought this, this was wonderfully representative because it's from different regions of the world. Uh, it's uh, companies that are at different stages. Uh, and maybe we can just start by having everybody uh, introduce themselves, describe a little bit about what they're doing. Uh, and uh, then you know, we can uh, sort of have a discussion about what's been easy, what's been hard, how can government policy, like uh, uh, the, the US government policy, help in advancing some of these issues? Uh, how can other countries' governments, because we have 20 uh, representatives from uh, other governments uh, participating in this summit. How, how should they think about encouraging uh, entrepreneurship? And then most uh, importantly, how can other businesses and venture capital, et cetera, think about some of these international opportunities? So Maya, why don't we start with you and, and tell us, I, I was hearing some of the great work you're doing. Tell us more about it. Um, thank you. It's so great to be here. Uh, <laughs> um, I started, I'm a software engineer. I have an engineering background. Um, I, one day I heard that the first startup weekend is happening in Cairo. And I was not invited, <laughs> but I went anyway with my Good friend. <laughs> Um, I went with my friend Nihal, uh, she was invited and we, she turned out to be my co-founder and we were there just to learn about startups, um, meet mentors and other entrepreneurs. Um, but it was very hard to network and meet people during the event. We felt like there is a gap between the organizers and the attendees. Um, and then a week after we attended TEDx Cairo and we had the same experience. We felt like there should be a better way for organizers to organize events and for the attendees to experience events. Um, everyone is there for networking, connecting people, and sharing experience. Um, so we did our research and we were very passionate about the idea. We felt like we can do something in the event space. So we quit our jobs and we started working on this full time before even having the name of Eventus. And, um, now, um, now we have a full engagement and networking platform for events. Um, it's a very interactive app with 86% engagement in most of our events. Uh, so we are helping people getting together during events. And um, now we have a great team, two offices in Cairo and Dubai, uh, and we are working with most of events uh, in our region. Um, when I look back on the journey, it wasn't easy at all. It was very challenging. It was very exciting as well, um, but it was full of uh, ups and downs. And we, we started before even the first accelerator in Egypt to start. Um, we had few mentors uh, back then, but now we have a number of amazing startups, uh, a number of mentors and support organizations who are working together to build the ecosystem. So I, I can see it's, it's, the ecosystem has grown very well, but we still have a lot to do. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Jean Basco. 
thank you. It's an honor to be here. So uh, when I was growing up in the rural villages in Rwanda, uh, I used to spend countless hours in the forest collecting firewood for my parents and fetching water. And that was not just me, but uh, dozens of other children in Africa are facing the same challenges. They are involved in uh, laborious activities uh, to help their parents just to prepare their meal instead of going to school. So as I was growing up, I kept thinking about uh, something that I can do to help these families have access to other alternative fuels that they can use uh, to replace charcoal wood that they have been using for uh, many years. So I came up with uh, an idea of uh, integrated waste management approach whereby we collect waste and then we turn them into affordable and uh, environmentally friendly products in form of uh, briquettes and biogas that the people can then use. And that is like a, a green cooking fuel uh, which can uh, improve health and sanitation uh, in homes. Uh, as we started, it has been two years and uh, we have employed more than 25 people, giving them permanent jobs. And uh, we are trying to expand to other areas of the country so that we can uh, continue to improve sanitation as well as providing this kind of alternative fuels uh, which can uh, improve uh, health and uh, mitigate climate change uh, in the country and uh, Africa in general. Excellent. Uh, it's an honor to be here. I'm still trying to get over the fact that you just introduced me. I'm so happy. <laughs> um, so I lead Laboratoria. We are a social enterprise, and we, I started it in Peru two years ago. We are now in Peru, in Chile, and Mexico. And what we try to do is to go out and find talent where nobody else is looking for it. So we try to identify young women who haven't been able to access quality education or job opportunities because of economic limitations and train them to become the most awesome web developers they can be and connect them with employment opportunities in the tech sector. Something that I realized is that when, when our students join our program, uh, they are most of them are completely unaware of their potential and, and they come thinking that it's going to be really hard to break this vicious cycle of low-skilled employment, un underpaid employment, or just domestic work. Uh, but they soon start learning to code, and it's just such a powerful skill set. They, a few weeks into the program, they start building their first websites, their first apps, their games, and showing them to the world, and it's so empowering. And, and six months after joining, they're ready to go out and join the workforce. So we have students who get three job offers from the coolest companies in town. They go out, they get to decide where they want to go and work. They triple their income, so they significantly improve their economic circumstances. They start supporting their families. And I think most importantly, they start realizing that anything is possible if they work hard enough for it, no? And, and we have students that have gone from working at a corner shop in a slum to working at the IDB in Washington as developers a few blocks from the White House. So, so really, they are an example that anything is possible, no? And they're, they're changing not only their lives, but they're changing their communities, their cities, and I think they are transforming the tech sector in Latin America. They are bringing the diversity and the talent that the sector needs to really become a leading force in our economies. And I'm pretty sure that as we continue to grow and reach thousands of women in the region, they are going to change our countries for the better and making sure that we can actually base our growth on the most important thing that we have, that's our, our young talent. That's great. Now, the, uh, should, uh, when we were talking backstage, I had been reading about this, and I said 60% of uh, the women who had gone through this program uh, now were employed, and I was corrected, it's not 70%. I had old data, but, uh, but I think it's... it's uh, it's important to, to point out uh, that your success rate has been quite extraordinary already. So Thank you. it's wonderful. Mark, when the, uh, there was a time when you were sort of in their shoes. Um, and, but, but now, uh, obviously Facebook's uh, success has been extraordinary. Uh, but I'm sure that you still can connect with the stories that are told here and some of the stories out there. Uh, how's Facebook thinking about uh, its own role in creating this platform for 
mm -hmm. uh, entrepreneurship around the world? I know that's something that you've been thinking a lot about. Well, it's really inspiring to be here with so many great entrepreneurs. And you know, to hear about all the work that you're doing, and it's, it's an honor, so thanks for, for having me. You know, to me, entrepreneurship is about creating change, not just creating companies. And you know, the, the most effective entrepreneurs that, who, who I've met care deeply about some mission and some change that they're trying to create, and often they don't even start because they're trying to create a company. Right? And you know, that's how, how I think about um, you know, my connection to, to all, all of us here is, you know, I was getting started. I, um, you know, I, wanted, I care deeply about giving everyone uh, a voice right? and giving people the tools to share everything that they cared about and uh, bringing a community together. And you know, it started small in, in one university. And I didn't think it was going to be a company at the time. Um, as a matter of fact, I was pretty convinced that at some point someone would build um, something like this for the world. But uh, you know, I thought that that would be some other company that you know, already had thousands of engineers and was used to building stuff for hundreds of millions of people around the world. And you know, what ended up happening was um, you know, that no one built it. Right? So we just kind of kept on going. Right? I mean, people said it each step along the way, um, you know, what you're doing. All right, maybe college students like it, but no one else is going to like it. And you know, there's not going to be any money in doing this. So, all right, so you only really do it if you care, right? If you're passionate about doing it. And you know, then it started growing, and people said it would be a fad, and it would never be a good business. But you know, you, you keep going because you care, uh, not because you're you're trying to create a business. Um, and you know, then there's the shift to mobile, where people thought that you know, it, it wouldn't be a sustainable business, and um, you know, it, through each of these things, you, you, the, the, the entrepreneurs who I think build things that last for a long time keep going because they care fundamentally about the change that they're trying to create in the world, um, and they're not in it just to, to build a company. And, you know, I, I carry that with me today. You know, so, you know, today we have, you know, we live in a world with more than 7 billion people, uh, but more than 4 billion uh, of us are not on the internet. And, you know, we talk about having an equal opportunity to be able to create a change in the world. And you know, I think that's a really hard thing to do if, uh, if you don't have access to some of the basic infrastructure uh, and, and technical tools that are necessary to, uh, to build this kind of, um, these kind of technical products. So you know, I, I kind of think about what we're doing today um, very similarly to, to how I thought about where we were at the beginning. You know, it's, uh, you know, I get people all the time who come to me and say, all right, well, you're investing billions of dollars in trying to uh, put internet connectivity in, in places where you know, we don't get paid for it. Um, it's not something that, uh, we'll, that we'll make any money from for a very long period of time if it works out. But you know, it's this deep belief that you're trying to make a change, you're trying to connect people in the world. And I really do believe that if you do something good and if you help people out, then eventually some portion of that good will come back to you. And you may not know up front what it's going to be, uh, but that's just been the guiding principle for me in the work that we've done. And I hope that some of the work that we do uh, can play a role in empowering you and so many more entrepreneurs to build uh, the next great companies. Excellent. So, so for, for the, the three budding entrepreneurs, uh, you, you've already had uh, some success and uh, positive feedback, but uh, I know that it's still hard sometimes and frustrating. And let's go back to the earlier question that I asked. Uh, what do you find to be some of the biggest hurdles for your success? And uh, are there policies that uh, either your governments could be pursuing or that the United States in conjunction with your governments could be pursuing that would really make uh, this process, if not easy, then at least a little bit smoother? Uh, and are there questions or concerns that you have in terms of how more established businesses like Facebook, uh, how they might be able to interact with uh, startups like yours? Um, so why, why don't we, we'll go in reverse order this time. Why don't we start with you? Yeah, so I think there's, there's been many challenges along the way. Um, on, on our case, we, we try to disrupt many preconceptions, I think. So at the beginning, many people were like, 
how are you going to train people in months, you know, and, and get them a job? How are you going to get a young woman who went to a public high school that's not very good to actually become competitive in the labor market? Um, and I think, luckily, we've, we've overcome those, and we've proved that uh, they are incredibly talented, that you can learn in months instead of years. Right. And most of the companies that hire our developers actually rehire, you know, so they've, they've realized that, that they're great, you know, and they're as competitive as anyone else who comes from a different background. So I think that's been very, very encouraging um, on our way. And I mean, the, li the little secret that I have, I think, being a social entrepreneur is that, that motivation is everything, you know, and, and, and when, we, when there's bad times and where we are not making the end of the month to, to pay all our, all our people and when we're, in, when we're facing all these challenges, I usually just go into the classroom, you know? I'm like, okay, let me go into the classroom. And I talk to the girls that study with us and it's just, I mean, they are the main force behind, not only myself, but all my team, you know, my partners and all my team because they are fighting so hard to making it happen. They are traveling, sometimes commuting four hours a day to come and go back. Uh, they, are, they have, on top of their studies, a lot of domestic responsibilities, and they're proving that it can be done. So, so that's always a reality check to say, you know, I have everything I need to keep going at this. Mm -hmm. Good. John yeah. Bosco. Uh, great. Uh, I think one of the most uh, biggest challenges uh, that I have faced uh, was because I started this company very young. At uh, that time, I was 19 years old, and uh, in my culture, it is believed that those uh, great initiatives are started by old people, and uh, those things which have been difficult for older people cannot be uh, possible for young people. So I tried to disrupt that uh, status quo, and uh, I created this company. But of course, during that period, uh, no one was even trusting me so that he can be my employee. So I had to be my own marketer, I had to be the technical boss, I had to be everything in the company so that I can build that kind of uh, first impression so that I can uh, imp impress few people to come to me and uh, uh, help me th uh, run this course. And uh, the other challenge that, I w that uh, we were facing is that uh, a lot of financial institutions didn't even know what we were talking about because this is uh, these are the kind of renewable energy that we wanted to bring to Rwanda, and uh, you you would find a lot of folks working in banks asking you what are you trying to do because they don't even understand what you are doing. It was uh, like very difficult for for them to analyze and calculate the risk that might be involved in uh, in uh, the activities that we are trying to do. Uh, but because I, I trusted in my solution and uh, this kind of thing that I want to do to my community, I kept pushing, applying for different competitions, and uh, luckily I won the United States uh, Africa Development Foundation grant uh, to start this uh, initiative. And when I started, uh, people started to see uh, how you can take advantage uh, on waste that you already have, to produce some products which can then go back in communities and be uh, solutions which can uh, improve lives of many people. And then uh, from there, people started coming. Uh, but the lesson that I learned uh, from that very basic experience is that uh, uh, no matter what you're trying to do, uh, necessary is that you are having uh, that kind of motive in your mind uh, that you want to help your society move forward. So the policies and the other uh, partners, stakeholders, will come along the way to help you run that initiative. But that will happen uh, once you start. If you don't start, no one will come and join you. Good. The, uh, so we've heard... Uh... No, it's interesting. I mean, part of what you, the two of you have described is, first of all, you know, each country has its own culture, and there are going to be sometimes some cultural barriers, um, whether it's attitudes about women uh, and what they can do, whether it's attitudes about young people uh, and, and, and how seriously they take uh, uh, a, a young person. You know, Mark had to deal with that a little bit, but here, obviously, in the United States, and particularly in Silicon Valley, I think that's begun to change. Um, 
but there's also just basic issues like financing and uh, having access to capital, uh, particularly when it's a new idea and it doesn't fit the existing models uh, that uh, the banks or, or other financial institutions may have. Uh, uh, my, what, what, uh, do those kinds of challenges resonate uh, in your experience? And, and how did you navigate through those? Um, yeah, definitely, like, I think all the entrepreneurs, like, everywhere in the world, we share the same challenges. Um, um, I think, I think I did almost every single mistake that you read about in every uh, startup-related book. <laughs> I learned everything the hard way. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's a learning process. It's, um, funding was one of the challenges, of course. Um, the other one was, um, the legal system and the legal structure, especially in Egypt, it's not startup friendly. Uh, so you have to do a lot of workarounds and you have to be persistent to get uh, over that. Um, building a team as well and like I'm a woman and um, I, I started, I was young and... You're still young, was, I think. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I think you qualify as young. Uh, so yeah, I, I had almost the same challenges. It's, um, I would say that the only thing that keeps us going is uh, believing in our idea, believing that we can do something, we can add value to people's life. Um, and this is the only thing that keeps me uh, um, walk every day in the morning and go to work. Yeah. Well, look, all of you just, uh, are expressing what Mark said, which is um, it starts with a passion. Uh, it, it, if you start off just saying, I want to make money, but there's no uh, clear mission in, behind it, then when you start hitting some of these barriers, sometimes it's very hard to push through them. Um, with respect to some of the barriers that you're talking about, I, uh, the U.S., in connection to the Entrepreneurship Summit, what we've been trying to do is, is take best practices and learn lessons about what's working and what's not. And uh, so, you know, in... The, the grants that we're providing or the training that we're providing, you know, uh, what these summits have been really useful in doing is hearing directly from entrepreneurs and uh, say, this program doesn't work as well as it could. This one works really well. What we're also trying to do, though, is encourage governments to listen and hear from entrepreneurs to build a different kind of culture. So uh, the, the point you made, uh, Maya, about uh, how hard is it to get a business started? Right? How much paperwork do you have to fill out? You know, what kinds of fees do you have to pay? Uh, you know, how much bureaucracy do you have to sort through? That's something that uh, here in the United States we've had to deal with ourselves, and what we've tried to do is to uh, both simplify processes but also use technology in ways that means you don't have to travel across town uh, in Cairo to go to an office and that. Uh, the person you need to see isn't there, and then you have to travel back and reschedule the next day, and the traffic's terrible, and you're, it's driving you crazy. If you can go on the net and do a lot of that work ahead of time, that can make a, a huge difference in accelerating uh, the, the process that you're, you're doing. And so I'm very glad that we have 20 countries represented here, because part of what we're doing is getting commitments from those other countries to say, we're going to learn from each other and figure out how we can streamline uh, these efforts so that we're making life a little bit easier for uh, young people like you. Yeah, actually, the, when we started, we didn't know where to start from. Like, we couldn't find any information online, for example, right. on how to get the company registered in Egypt. Uh, we didn't know any startup lawyers or anyone who can register the company for us. So we had to go ourselves and ask for, for help from right. other people. And we couldn't find any information. It took yeah. us so, so, so much uh, time, um, efforts, and, and money. Yeah. Well, even here in the United States, where it's much easier to do business, we, have, we still have 16 agencies that are in charge of doing business. We've tried to streamline them into one. It requires congressional action. So we, uh, so at least what we've tried to do is to consolidate the websites so that it's easier to get the information, even though you still have to deal potentially with 16 different agencies for different needs. Um, so, so there are specific things that the government can do 
to be more entrepreneur friendly. Uh, how can uh, companies uh, like Facebook or Google or some of the venture funds that are represented here, uh, how should they think about finding uh, good ideas? Um, you know, what uh, sorts of mentorship or training uh, would you find most helpful? Uh, you know, obviously, having experienced entrepreneurs or people who've seen startups in the past maybe can help you avoid a few of the lessons. Uh, and part of the goal of the summit here is to build these networks so that uh, that, uh, that kind of mentorship is available. But uh, Mark, I know that Facebook's already doing some of these issues. Uh, yeah. Tell us about some of the things that you're excited about, and then maybe we can hear from them about uh, other uh, networking opportunities that they'd be looking for. Sure. Well, we have a developer program all over the world where um, you know, we go around and um, it's called FB Start, mm -hmm. and we, we give entrepreneurs uh, free access to tools, and some of them, um, a lot of the tools that people can use are free uh, from, from Facebook and other places, but in order to, to help get started with businesses, um, we give uh, to, to different companies tens of thousands of dollars worth of uh, Facebook tools to, to get started, but it's also important to uh, help people learn how to use the tools um, so we do these entrepreneurship workshops around the world uh, and for both people who are starting to create uh, technical companies, uh, but also for small businesses, which are, I think, an, an important part, maybe less the focus of this summit, but that, that's a, a huge part of um, what we try to do around the world and, and help people uh, get on the internet and, and connect with, with people that they're trying to sell their products to. And we have more than 50 million uh, small business pages uh, that, that are on Facebook, and a large number of them use it as their, their primary presence for uh, communicating with people and attracting new customers. So that's, that's a, a pretty good basic tool that, that's out there. The, the biggest thing that, that I'm personally focused on is, um, is connectivity, though. I mean, it's, I think um, you know, for, for you guys, and we talked about this a little bit backstage, um, you know, I think you're mostly in places that have reasonable connectivity. I mean, you were, you were talking about how, you know, sometimes when you go home, it's not, not so good. But in, in general, I, I think um, for a whole nother big population wave of folks, this really is a blocking factor. Right? I mean, if you grew up and um, you've never used a, a computer or you've never had access to the internet, um, it's often hard to even imagine what, what you're missing out on. So I, I and you know, this is a local problem that I think we you know, need to do a better job of uh, empowering folks in different countries to be able to spread connectivity. I mean, this isn't something that you know, the, the US or some American company can come in and do. In the places where it's worked, it's been in partnership with, uh, with local companies and local entrepreneurs and, um, and local governments. And that's also something that I'd love your guys' advice on how you think we could be doing a better job of, of spreading connectivity to enable not just you guys, but other entrepreneurs who haven't even had the opportunities um, that, that you've had to, to mm. build things as well. Well, tell us, tell us uh, what's happening in Peru in terms of connectivity and uh, how does that connect with uh, creating the supply for all these wonderful young women that you're training? Uh, obviously, things are growing. Uh, yeah, yeah. But, uh, but uh, you know, speak to, to Mark's point about uh, you know, how you see things unfolding, uh, both in Peru and in Latin America yeah. uh, over well, the next several years? First of all, uh, Facebook is such an amazing tool for us because we often target women who have had limited access to the digital world as a whole, but no matter where you go, Facebook is there, you know? I think that young people today initiate their digital lives through Facebook. So every single girl in our program, even though they don't have email and they, they have a limited use of the internet, they have a Facebook account. And well, Mark's very happy to hear this. <laughs> yeah. I am. I am. <laughs> and this is a great connection because it's a starting point, you know? And, and we usually start on our events where we do awareness raising about our program and encourage young women to apply. We, we talk a lot about Facebook because this is a, a web app you know and can, do you know what's behind it and, and that's actually a, a very important thread in our communication so thank you it helps a lot um, and in terms of connectivity I think Latin America is is I mean it's moving forward but there's still many important challenges um, 
as we were discussing before, the service is not often the best because there's very few companies in the market and, and this brings some challenges, no? And, and we also have, a, um, I mean, many, many of the Latin American countries are very centralized in the capital city or in the major cities where usually connectivity is not a problem, but as you get further away, uh, it becomes a challenge, no? So I think it should definitely be a priority for our governments. In the case of Peru, I think the government is realizing that this is important. And I have to say we've been really lucky, in, both in Peru and in Chile, we've had support from the government because they realize that they not only need to expand access to digital services, but they also need to start bringing in more people to create digital products. You know, we have a talent gap. And if we want to evolve and, and have more digital services, who's going to build them? So, so that's been really lucky on our side. Um, and just one final point, I think, uh, I think it's crucial for entrepreneurs to work hand in hand with big companies and with government. I think that we entrepreneurs have the amazing advantage of being able to take huge, sometimes irresponsible risks, you know? We can just go out and try new things all the time. And this is something that as you become larger, and if you're a government, it's, it's way harder, no? So, so I think we have a role to play there in building new things, in creating new things. And I think when it comes to scaling up those things, these partnerships are essential to enable us to take what we've built and created and tested and tried to a larger scale. I think that's a great point. So for example, the, the kind of training you're doing, uh, even with our entire education infrastructure here, we still have that same gap. Yeah. Uh, we initiated something through our administration called Tech Hire where we're going into yeah. uh, uh, communities and cities that, uh, where people can't imagine that they could somehow be part of the tech industry. Yeah. And what we're finding is, is that through months of training, in some cases through a community college, in some cases companies uh, who are joining with us, uh, it, it turns out that you can train people uh, very effectively. And as we prove concept, now we have the opportunity to scale up throughout uh, the job training programs that already exist in the U.S. government. So I think you're making a terrific point that in the same way that your individual companies are taking risks, proving concept, and then trying to scale up in the private sector, part of what governments need to be doing is when they see something that is working, a tool, uh, a, an app, uh, a mechanism, that saves time, makes something more convenient, makes a product uh, more uh, accessible to people, then we have to be prepared to change how we do business and, and potentially uh, scale up as well. So uh, you know, you're right that it, it's hard sometimes for governments to take massive risks, but what governments can do is to partner with entrepreneurs, start small, work out the kinks, and then uh, be able to back the process of scaling up in that way. So, uh, Jean Bosco, uh, any uh, additional thoughts in terms of how uh, not only Mark, but all these VCs out here can help you out? <laughs> Make your pitch, man. Tell, tell them uh, <laughs> how, how, they, how they can pull out their checkbook. And... Yeah, uh, I think uh, Facebook is doing a great job in terms of improving connectivities. And uh, when you look at the situation in my country, we are really trying, uh, but we still have a lot of, uh, a, long, a long way to go because um, connectivity is only available in cities. And uh, you know, although you can find it in the villages, but um, it's not really fast so that you can uh, use it on uh, some more activities like uh, watching videos or sending heavy files uh, to other people. So we are still having a challenge in terms of connectivity and uh, a rapid internet. Uh, but what uh, we're trying to do as small businesses is uh, looking at the tools uh, that uh, big companies like Facebook offers so that you can benefit from them, like using messengers to exchange messages uh, with uh, our potential customers. And uh, you know we use uh, like uh, adverts uh, to see how we can disseminate uh, messages. You know, because in my country, uh, a lot of people don't know these kind of uh, waste management things that you want to bring. 
And uh, you see that in many places, people don't sort waste at the source. They just throw waste everywhere. But uh, we are using this kind of technology to teach people that they have to sort waste from organic to non-organic because this is beneficial in this way and this is harmful in this way. So we are trying to use this kind of tools to disseminate such image. And uh, the challenge that we are still facing is the fact that, uh, you know, when you are still small, of course, uh, you are like uh, having like 10 years uh, in front of you so that you can uh, attract attention from many people to come and join you. Uh, but uh, depending on this kind of spotlight, exposure, support that you are getting from different people, we are trying to benefit from these kind of initiatives to disseminate it, uh, the messages and uh, uh, bring attention of many people to what we're doing. Uh, Mark? Yeah, I don't know where to start exactly. In, in Egypt, Facebook, we started a revolution out of Facebook. <laughs> <So> <laughs> Um, Facebook was the only way we communicate uh, during the revolution and after that, and I believe, the, I, I, I believe you have the numbers, but um, the Facebook penetration has grown trem tremendously since then. And um, it's, it's a basic tool now. Like now everyone on, on, in Egypt, they have Facebook. Um, and uh, we were just talking um, about b uh, Facebook basics and now it's, um, it was blocked in Egypt. Um, so I think there is a lot to do. Um, and also, back to the connectivity thing, I think uh, um, I'm praying now if um, I'm not sure if my team and my family are watching this or not because they can't live stream. <laughs> <laughs> I hope they are not seeing, uh, seeing the, <laughs> the buffer <laughs> <the> loading. <laughs> That's so irritating. Yeah. <laughs> I know. Yeah, it's, it's very basic. <laughs> I hear you. If it makes you feel any better, it happens to me too. Yeah, yeah uh, it's. Uh, I thought you know, I'd have the best gear, but I'm just sitting there waiting. waiting. Yeah, it, it, it affects the business as well. I'm, now I moved to Dubai, and I have to manage the team in Cairo, and it's very hard to communicate. Um, it's very hard to do like a Skype call with the team or something like that. Um, so we have to work around it. Um, we have to pay a lot of money, actually. I, I have been trying to get another line in the, in the office uh, for like four months now, and we still didn't get another line. So the, the network- That's in Dubai. Are, that's in Egypt, in that's Cairo. Cairo. Yeah. Right. Uh, no, Dubai is- it's, it's better. It's even, yeah, it's much more better, yeah. They, uh, well, look- Yeah, they're doing an amazing job in Dubai, yeah. yeah. I mean, some of this is, is, you raise a couple of important points. Uh, first of all, the, the huge opportunity here is for countries uh, to leapfrog existing infrastructure. And we're, obviously, we see this in Africa, in India, places where mobile uh, banking uh, and uh, payment systems have accelerated uh, even more rapidly than they have here. Uh, farmers using uh, information to uh, access prices to markets so that they're selling their goods uh, at, a, at a decent price. So there, there's an infrastructure and connectivity function that uh, governments can play. You're raising another question, uh, an issue though, uh, which is, is sensitive, a uh, sensitive topic in some countries, which is openness. Okay, it, it is hard to foster and encourage an entrepreneurial culture if it's closed and if information flows are blocked and what we are seeing around the world uh, oftentimes is uh, governments uh, wanting the benefits of entrepreneurship and connectivity, but thinking that top-down control is also compatible with that, and it's not. Uh, you know, people remark on my 2008 campaign and how we were really early adapters of, of so much technology. It wasn't because I knew what I was doing, it's because a bunch of 20-year-olds came to me and said, hey, there's this new thing called MySpace, or, you know. Ouch. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, that was just a little day today. But the point is that they had all this stuff that I had never heard of. 
And if I had tried to maintain control and say, no, 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 they, you know, we're, we're going with, uh, you know, pamphlets. Because <laughs> I'm used to pamphlets. And I can control what's in the pamphlet. Then I might not be sitting here. So, uh, well, the same is true for governments as a whole. There, 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 there is a, a cultural shift that is sometimes difficult that says uh, we are empowering individuals and we are uh, open to ideas. We are willing to admit new information that maybe contradicts our old preconceptions. We're willing to test those new ideas, and if they don't work, we're going to try something else. Uh, that's the connection between connectivity and the internet and science. A uh, part of what has created all this, part of what Stanford is all about, is our capacity to say, we don't know. To, to, to say that all the received wisdom might not be right, and we're willing to test it. And that is threatening sometimes. It's threatening to governments, it's threatening to cultures, but that is the essence of discovery and innovation. And so, uh, one of the things that we've been trying to do and dis uh, encourage through the State Department is to uh, gently, and sometimes bluntly, uh, talk to governments about their need to uh, maintain uh, an openness and a confidence in uh, their own people. Now, it, what makes it harder, admittedly, is the fact that the openness and the power of connectivity also can empower some bad people. And so us wrestling with how do we counter the sort of violent extremism that can end up poisoning the mind and resulting in uh, what we saw happening in Orlando. Uh, that's a constant balance that we're trying to weigh. Um, but what I worry about is people using that as an excuse then to try to block things off and uh, uh, control the flow of information. Uh, and, and, and that's a question that I think young people are, are uh, attuned to and are going to have to pay attention to and all of us are going to have to fight for uh, in the years to come. Uh, well, this has been an extraordinary conversation. How are we doing on time? Uh, it's, we're all done, but I'm having so much fun. <laughs> give, that, give our panelists a big round of applause. Congratulations for the great work you're doing. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. And I'm sure your family was watching. I hope so. <laughs> if not, we'll, they'll be seeing it on the YouTube. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. That was great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, we're very proud of what you're doing. That's terrific. We're going to go out this way, I think. Yep, right there. Please welcome the Honorable Maria Contreras Sweet, Administrator of the United States Small Business Administration. Let's take a seat. We've got a little more going on here, but thank you for your attention. President Obama, let's give him another applause. Woo! Wow. I think in every language we understand the word wow, wow, wow. Everybody seated? Settled? Uno, dos y tres. Uno, dos y tres. You know, somebody said that with a group, you can do anything. So why don't we together as a group, when I say three, we'll say shh. Uno, dos, tres, one, two, three, shh. 
Thank you, thank you so much. But listening to these panels this morning, assure me that the golden age of entrepreneurship has only just begun. Indeed, yes, exactly right, yes. It is just beginning and the entrepreneurs like you in this room are the genesis of human progress. Recall Robert F. Kennedy who famously said, there are those who look at things the way they are and ask why, and there are those that dream of things that never were and ask why not. The people who have changed the course of history have always asked why not. And each of you is here today because you have asked, why not? As one Korean entrepreneur here told me yesterday, while talent is spread equally around the world, opportunity is not. I'm here to ask you, why not? At your very core, you are driven by a desire to improve lives. You see a challenge and you build a solution. You have the audacity, as the president says, to create new realities and the confidence to overturn the status quo. Recently in Colombia, I met two entrepreneurs who developed advanced